The Dark Wars De Kildor left the dominant Trenum and traveled throughout the realm, following the whims of his own interests. With the ability to travel between planes, he occupied himself for nearly 400 million years by traveling to multiple universes, doing as he pleased. He raised several beings to near godlike status, created many empires, and gained positions of power in almost every plane. He also caused the genocide of countless races, crumbled ancient empires, and destroyed entire universes whenever he saw fit. De Kildor had many wives and children during this time, but never became as invested in them as he had with Daisy. It is speculated that in any given plane of this realm, a percentage of the populace can claim to be the descendants of De Kildor. Though these claims are seemingly impossible to prove, there was one being De Kildor encountered whose DNA was closer to his than any other he would meet. In service to an unseen organization outside the realm, a being known only by the code name Dark Destructor made an appearance in the same place once housing the worlds of the Dominant Trenum. His appearance was similar to De Kildor's, but with long black hair and a red tint to his skin. The organization he worked for had funded operations within the realm for millions of years, including the cybernetic technologies industry responsible for Daisy's death. Through genetic manipulation of demonic DNA, the organization had worked to perfect super soldiers no longer distinguishable as demons. They had also found a way to merge the DNA of the strongest warriors in history with that of these soldiers. Dark Destructor was a result of De Kildor's own DNA being infused with that of a demonic super soldier. Supremely potent with energy manipulation and cursed with the same immortality as De Kildor, Dark Destructor was a force to be reckoned with. He commanded a fleet of starships teeming with demonic super soldiers, each given the DNA of a powerful hero from history. They swept across the worlds, conquering the weak and enslaving the strong, forcing the populace to watch as the heroes of their legends tore them apart. De Kildor remained oblivious to this for a very long time. While whole planes fought Dark Destructor and the Sinister Organization, he remained in others where his own whims had guided their destiny. Having grown tired of owning worlds and elevating kings, he had taken to mastering the art of music and touring various worlds as an undercover member in various bands. Most inhabitants were unaware who he really was, and the name De Kildor became something of a legend once again. Deciding to try touring in another plane, De Kildor shifted to a location at random, landed on a world, and was mistaken for Dark Destructor. The people groveled to him, pleading to be spared, and, at first, he simply assumed he had been here before, but did not recognize the place. Once he learned the truth of what was going on, he was outraged. The idea that his DNA had created this being without permission, and the ties of the mysterious organization to the former cybernetic technology industry, was enough to get him involved in the war. He made his way to the nearest world under attack by the organization, and descended like a lightning bolt. He slaughtered waves of the demonic super soldiers effortlessly. Being so powerful, they could individually annihilate armies. The resistance that had stood against these super soldiers watched in awe as a single being executed army after army with near flawless precision. Dark Destructor was not among them. The leader of the resistance made contact, hoping to recruit De Kildor. The war across worlds had caused so much death and despair, it had been nicknamed the Dark Wars. De Kildor responded with only one question. Where is Dark Destructor? On a moon circling a gas giant, Dark Destructor had set his primary base of operations for the latest assaults. He worked closely with the generals of the organization, coordinating strikes and long-term occupations. They were surrounded by fleets of ships that could fend off any major attack from the outside, but they weren't expecting a single man to fly in without a ship at nearly the speed of light. De Kildor struck the moon with enough impact to create a massive crater, leveling Dark Destructor's base. His body reformed as he pulled himself from the crater, and Dark Destructors did as well. The two immortals faced off in a clash that would have been spectacular had anyone or anything been around to see it. But, in the end, De Kildor had many more years of experience when compared to Dark Destructor, and defeated him handily. Cleaving Dark Destructor's head from his body, De Kildor flew to a planet of molten rock and buried it deep inside. He then took Dark Destructor's body, shifted to another plane, and tossed it toward a black hole to slowly be sucked in. Good luck coming back from that, he snickered. Returning to the moon base, he cast an illusion to make himself indistinguishable from Dark Destructor. He rose his arms and, with his now perfected mastery of the physical prime, recreated the base as if it had never been destroyed. Commanding the fleets and occupations, he positioned each and every unit to be overwhelmed by the Resistance, who he had also remained in contact with. By the time the organization knew he had taken Dark Destructor's place, they had no chance of stopping the Resistance from slowly eradicating their forces. Before the organization shut down all communication, they expressed their frustration with the Keldor. Inadvertently, they let slip the fact that they were an organization originating from another realm. De Keldor took this as an invitation to learn how to travel to other realms, and pay them a visit. 
the realm of limbo. It took the Keldor a long time to uncover a method for traveling between realms, but immortality and years of patience can accomplish much. The only method he was able to uncover was one involving the creation of portals, but when he went to test it, he was unaware of the dangers of realm travel. Since realms work on different rules of physics than one another, the abilities an individual acquires in one do not necessarily translate in another. Additionally, the body's very functionality can be different, causing most beings to die instantly upon arrival in a new realm. What's more, if the calculations for entry are off by even a little, the traveler will not arrive in the realm they were hoping to. Instead, they will be pulled into a realm where all lost travelers go, a place called Limbo. Originally nothing more than a vast emptiness existing everywhere and nowhere at once, Limbo was believed by some to be a cosmic default location, set up to catch beings that accidentally stumbled into non-existing space. Though such occurrences may sound unlikely, this actually happens all the time. There is no logically understood space between realms. So miscalculations during realm travel automatically pulls the traveler into limbo. Anytime a being tries to tear space in a way that would create an area without space, they also get pulled into limbo. Anytime someone attempts to destroy the cosmos by collapsing it in on itself, they also end up in limbo. Regardless of how ridiculous it may sound, limbo is an actual place that can be reached only by attempting to go somewhere that should not exist. When de Kildor opened his first portal to another realm and stepped through, his calculations were off. He was teleported across known reality and spewed out into limbo. Since limbo was a new realm and its physics functioned differently from those of the realm de Keldor was from, he lost almost all his powers while there. His immortality curse, constant as ever, was the only power that remained with him. It allowed his body to survive the massive shifts in physics, and after a number of years, his body adapted to the new physics enough to be able to move about like any other human. Until that time, he remained mostly immobile and in tremendous pain. His portal opened near a free-floating landmass with three cities, a forest, and farmlands on it. His body landed in a heap on the ground, later discovered by the locals. When it was determined he was alive, he was taken to a hospital where he was studied by the physicians, then taken to a ward where he could be cared for while given extreme physical therapy. Dekelder did not know why the physicians took care of him for years without asking for anything in return. He did not know why they invested so much effort in teaching him to eat, move, walk, talk, and eventually even run. He did not know why they had lecturers teach him the history of Limbo and the science of their realm, but he was grateful. The lecturers informed him Limbo had not always had land masses and planets within it. Long ago, it had been a seemingly endless expanse of nothingness. Even immortal beings like himself would have been incapable of ever escaping the endless void in those days. Only the most powerful beings found ways to travel to it and through it without overcoming seemingly impossible odds. These powerful beings found Limbo useful as a place to store equipment and exile hard-to-kill enemies. Then, one day, a being named Veldazin discovered that Limbo could be used as a transportation hub to every corner of the cosmos. Since it existed everywhere and nowhere, beings who entered Limbo could return to any place they wanted to go if a proper portal system was established. Veldin specialized in technologies that could safely teleport beings into and out of other realms in such a way that altered their physicality as they traveled. They still lost any abilities that did not translate into the changed physics while there, but were able to move under their own powers without having to adapt their whole bodies. Veldazin quickly changed his name to Lord Veldazin and claimed all of Limbo as his personal property. He began charging attacks to anyone storing equipment in Limbo, and a toll on anyone using Limbo for transit. With the money he amassed, he hired several contractors who helped him develop a way to bring entire planets into Limbo. In time, they also created a method to keep those planets alive outside their natural environments. Once this method was refined to perfection, Veldazin fired the contractors and began stealing worlds across the cosmos. Though it had previously been an empty nothingness, Limbo was soon filled with planets, stars, and floating land masses that somehow were able to sustain their own life. It was labeled the Central Commerce Hub of the Cosmos, and began attracting races from billions of universes looking for wealth and power. Veldazin charged these beings to live in Limbo and made incalculable profits. But like any good idea built on capitalistic ingenuity, it was destined to be ruined by a vicious takeover. A being composed of living darkness, calling himself the Shockerock, rose up from Limbo's dregs and challenged Veldazin for complete control. Seeing him as a revolutionary, the people of Limbo rallied behind the Shockerock and toppled Veldazin's empire in a matter of days. Veldazin was crushed, literally and figuratively, and the Shockerock was placed in charge of Limbo with the blessing of its people. The people soon learned that the Shockerock, a being of living darkness, was not the best person to place in charge of their lives. 
Under his rule, they became little more than slaves, and their individual significance was reduced to that of a corporate resource. Limbo became a horrible place to live, and before long, the citizens began demanding that the Shakarak be removed from power. This created a rift in the political landscape of Limbo, and now nearly half of the worlds of Limbo were under the Shakarak's control, and the others directly opposed him. War was on the horizon, but had not yet taken hold. Shaky treaties kept the resistant worlds and those under the Shakarak at peace for the moment. But everyone knew this would not last much longer. The people of the land Mastikildor was on were considered neutral on all this, but feared they would be dragged into the war anyway. Dekildor had no idea that the Shakarak was the same being created in the time of the Ancients by Shak, the original leader of the Strider forces in the war with the Black Angel. After the fall of the Ancients, the Shakarak had resigned himself to live in silence in limbo, until Veldazin had inadvertently woken him from his slumber. By that time, he had been driven mad by grief, leading to his abrupt decision to take Veldazin's place. Dekildor would not learn the truth of this until long beyond the point of it being of value to him. The Shakarak would not learn of Dekildor's origin either. It was as if the two had been destined to meet, but never to know why. When Dekildor was strong enough to do work, he started helping out around the hospital. His immortality gave him the ability to take on dangerous jobs without risk of permanent injury, but other than that, he was identical in ability to an average human. It was humbling and peaceful, and Dekildor hated every moment of it. He knew he should be appreciative and, on the outside, he was, but he wept into his pillow like a blubbering baby every night. The once powerful Lord of the Shadows had been neutered of his grand power.